The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Subject to get a little bit loud in here. Can, can everybody hear me? Well, but the, the microphone. Is yeah, because you're going to have to have the mic for the. Gotcha. Uh, Okay, uh, well, first of all, we had planned on putting slides together this morning to have something to show you guys besides our, I wouldn't use the word beautiful, but selves. And um, as you might have figured out, we've pretty well been putting out fires all day and all night last night. And we used beer for some of those last night, I'll have to be honest. But um, we, we've pretty well been too busy, sadly, to put together any type of presentation. And so... This will be our presentation. I'm really sorry. I really am, but you know, it, it is what it is. We can't really do much for it. Um, the hot kind. Yes, yes. Um, so, quick introductions. Are uh, I'm Robbie Workman. I am, you know, just me for the most part. I'm on the Slackware development team, uh, which sounds all fancy, but really isn't. Uh, I, pretty well carry the light loads. Uh, I'm not really qualified to do much more than that, but, uh, you know, XORG, stuff like that. I uh, also founded the slackbuilds.org team back in 06, along with another guy named Eric Hansen, who's out of Minnesota. Um, I, I'm not a software person or even a computer person from the early days. I don't have any formal education there. I teach high school physics and chemistry at a, uh, about a 1700 student high school in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I got to throw in the roll tide, or my wife would be disappointed. Um, so, you know, she would be. Um, so that that's pretty well my background. I, I high school teacher, and I do the software stuff for fun. It's it's kind of a hobby for me. Um, Alan, you want to go next? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm uh, the sexiest man on this podium, Alan Hicks. Uh, I'm the senior Linux systems administrator at Intermedia Outdoors. We do uh, Guns and Ammo magazine. We own the Sportsman's Channel, North American Whitetail, yada yada. Uh, Seem like a good fit. Uh, so, yeah, that's me. I've been doing junk for a while. Uh, and I guess that's all I got to say about that. All right, I'm David Somro. I'm a uh, electronics technician. This is my trade. Uh, Slackware enthusiast. I'm also a Slackbuilds.org uh, admin. And I'm uh, <laughs> Rob McGee, uh, Dev Robbo, uh, known as Robbo on IRC, and um, the token Unix graybeard among this group. Um, I've been using Slackware since what? Uh, I've been using Slackware since about uh, 1998, uh, I believe. And uh, well, I try to be an email consultant. Um, am I too close to that? Hey, how about let's do the hand mic? Yes, we do the hand mic. Let's do the hand mic. All right. Here, Things are up. just getting too much static. That one's better anyway, right? Okay. Okay. Anyway, I try to do email consulting on the side, um, and um, I work with slackbuilds.org also. And we've been going crazy since we got here on Thursday. Um, you want to take it first start? Okay, so I don't know how much background you guys know about what was supposed to happen and, and what actually happened. Um, about three months ago, the Southeast Linux Fest had talked with uh, several different prospective internet providers and settled on Time Warner. Uh, Time Warner Cable said, oh yes, we have, we, we already provide cable to the hotel, and so 
being able to provide internet would not be an issue at all. We should be able to provide you a cable modem, uh, put it wherever you'd like, in a closet, out in your work area, whatever, and we can give you a 50 megabit connection for a very reasonable rate. And so the Southeast Linux Fest, of course, said, yay, that sounds great. And we haven't thought much about it since then. Uh, Roughly, I think I may have some of the time frames not quite right, but I think a week or so, maybe two weeks ago, Jeremy got a call or email from someone with Time Warner, and uh, he, all this is in his name. You know, Jeremy Sands, the coordinator of this, and somehow Time Warner had noticed that his address is in South Carolina. And so they said, hey, wait, you don't live in our service area. We can't provide you service. And so Jeremy sent a nice message back, and, and nice is probably not the right word, but you get the idea, um, that said, hey, I don't want this for my house, this is for the Blake Hotel, so that got fixed up, and then uh, we arrived, what day did we get here, Wednesday? Thursday. Well, Thursday, Thir the day, yeah, Thursday, the day before all this was scheduled to start, we came up early Thursday morning, uh, expecting that Time Warner would be out to set up the internet, and indeed, they had come out Wednesday, and came into the hotel, looked at the wherever the patch panel down in the basement, everything comes in here, and said, oh, we can't do this, sorry. You know, we, we can't set up any type of internet. We don't have the right stuff coming in. And so then Jeremy called them back after that and said, no, you idiots, and I think that's kind of the word he used, no, we don't want you to provide more service to the hotel. We want you to do what you told us you would do, which is pull some coax from somewhere in here, wherever you come in, drop us a cable modem. And so they came back out Thursday while we were here to do that. And it was at that point that the tech that came out happened to look at the coax in the hotel and, oh, it's receive only coax. And to make a long story short, Time Warner said, sorry, we can't do anything for you. Um, however, the tech said, well, we don't mind pulling coax across the parking lot and running into the building somewhere else if the hotel's okay with that. And so, of course, we asked the hotel, and the hotel says, oh, yeah, that's fine with us, because after all, we're giving them a lot of money. And it says, sure, that's fine. If you want to run coax across the parking lot, we have no problem at all. And so we told Time Warner that, and the Time Warner guy says, well, that's fine. I don't mind doing it. That's no problem at all. But the access point is out here in the middle of the sidewalk. And so to run coax or whatever, any type of cable out of that access point, we have to cross about that much sidewalk, which requires approval from the city. And so we got in touch with the city, and the city said, oh, yeah, that's no problem at all. We'll approve it. But Time Warner has to make the request. And so we got back in touch with Time Warner, and it was about that point that we haven't heard from them again. And so this was the day before the conference, roughly around noon when we all this kind of got kicked in motion. Um, so, you know, that's, that tells you how our event started off. We really thought this was going to be much easier. And so from there, uh, David, uh, well, I'll let David tell that story. Which one? The coax. Anyway. Okay. Okay. So we're uh, setting up our network without internet, and we are uh, running the cabling to find the uh, access points, trying to get them spread out so that we have good coverage, not too many people on the single access point. And uh, we're running down the uh, walls trying to hide the cables and trying to hide the access points so people don't uh, trip over them, kick them, whatever. Happen to notice a Cat5 cable dangling from the ceiling. <laughs> so <laughs> we decided let's hook up to this Cat5 cable and see what we have there. And lo and behold, we hit the gateway for the uh, hotel internet. <clears throat> so, yes, this is a secret. Nobody from the hotel is here, right? <laughs> so then we, uh, we decide, well, we already have a super long 200 yard or 200 foot run just to get up there. So rather than try and do just some kind of coupler or anything, we took a router and turned it into a dumb switch. 
and uh, basically converted our switch into the router uh, repeater so that we could get down this long run of the wire. And uh, that's been working okay-ish. Yeah, they got it capped off. It's about two megabit. Uh, we ran speed test on it. It, it. It's okay, but the internet at the hotel is not very good. The front desk people have issues. Their systems lag, uh, and we've been seeing that on our stuff directly tied in. So it's it's not been not been real good. Okay, you want to go? Sure. Um, we really have done some interesting stuff on the inside, um, which, yeah, uh, we, we, you want to get to the internet. That's the main thing you're going to want from the network, but that's not the only thing. We have set up, um, well, initially it was three VLANs, virtual LANs. Um, we have one for the staff, one for the vendors, and one for the public. Yeah, um, VLAN, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a, um, all right, no, I'm going to have you explain what a VLAN okay. is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get somebody who knew what he was talking about to do this part. Uh, a VLAN, it, it's actually the standard 802.1Q, but that's not real important. Basically, all it does is at the data link layer where your MAC address is in an in a IP packet, it adds an additional field, which is, you know, basically a binary numerical identification. Uh, and you can do it either on your, on your box, on your switch, uh, you know, various different locations. And based on that, uh, based on that VLAN tag, you can have, you know, multiple subnets on a single interface. You can route them differently, yada, yada. For example, these, uh, these uh, access points, you'll notice that they're offering self-public, self-vendor, and self-staff. Those are VLANs 10, 20, and 30. Whenever you connect up, the access point adds a VLAN tag, and then when it gets back to our, uh, our Linux box, we can serve a different DHCP range based on that tag. We can serve you into a different subnet. We can route you differently. We can offer different services based on that. So it's really very simple and ridiculously powerful when you consider it. Because, you know, otherwise, if you want, you know, different subnets and you want to actually filter on it or, or route based on it and such, you're going to have to have multiple NICs. You know, you're going to have to have one NIC for public, one NIC for vendor one nick for staff and one nick for your internet and then we would actually have to have a fifth nick for our second internet which we'll get to in a bit uh so you know it's it's ridiculous right now we're just running everything on two and you know that seems to work real well uh, so anyhow what we did was once we got you know the land here set up we had to figure out what the hell we're going to do with this teeny little two megabit connection and 700 people wanting to use it. And, you know, we had promised the vendors they would have full internet access, so we had to give it to them. And there's quite a few vendors, and, you know, you can imagine that many people can probably bring a two megabit link to its knees. Uh, and then, you know, staff is going to need it for various different things, you know, pull in the registration database from their servers and whatnot. So, you know, there's that's a requirement just to run the conference and from there we had to decide you know what are we going to do for public and so we had to do you know a best effort we added you know some local services here and our c daemon and stuff we allowed uh, icmp out i think we allowed secure shell out as well uh we couldn't allow http because it was just going to be too much Oh, yeah, we blocked SSH, sorry. I think we were worried about people tunneling, and once you start getting people tunneling, then, uh, yeah, that, that two megabit connection is dial-up. That's what I would have done, so. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. That's what I would have done, too. Um, that's the tragedy of the commons for you. You can Wikipedia that now that we got net. Uh, if any of y'all want to go, come on. I'm just rambling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, he, he uh, thank you for stretching your 30-second explanation out into five minutes. You're welcome. Uh, 
Okay, we've got our three uh, VLANs, as you can see on the um, access points. The, they correspond to um, what we have on the Ethernet also. Um, <clears throat> we've done different um, levels of terms of service for those, and uh, I'm gonna, that's going to go to Robbie on that. Um, we've got separate network ranges for each one of those. Um, um, we don't care about uh, what the actual IP ranges are, but we've given each different privileges to each uh, range. Um, yeah, what else do we want to go over on that? Okay, talk about this. Has everyone seen the at least the self server at some point? I guess I guess if you tried to go out over HTTP, you would have seen that because we were basically capturing everything for a while there. Um, as Rob here was pointing out, you know, we we finally got some decent internet, but but before we get into that, what I was having to do with the with the two megabit connection is, and I you know I don't know how many of you are still limited in your home internet. It seems that most people these days have you know a cable connection or DSL or something, and I'm one of the unfortunate ones to live far enough into the woods that my internet options are dial up or some sort of mobile broadband. And by mobile broadband, I think the broad part of that is is usually a big stretch um, but so I'm on basically cell phone connection for my home internet still that that's all I can get so the whole QoS stuff was something I had to learn at least passably so early on or else my wife's forays into YouTube and whatnot would make the connection completely unusable for me and that wasn't an option so prioritizing SSH and, and various other things uh, early on was something I had to learn and so I thought, okay, well, I can do that here. And so that's basically what I've done is uh, on the two megabit connection we had, uh, DNS traffic, of course, had first priority and uh, SSH had priority because of, you know, the staff and whatnot and still needed SSH out. Um, I'd have to pull it up to, to see exactly how I prioritized everything. But there's QoS in place for, um, you know, prioritizing different forms of traffic. Uh, and then, you know, I don't know how soon we want to get into this, but anything, anybody else have anything else that, before we get into the new internet, the public we'll internet? Into the new internet, the tunneling and all that? Yeah, that's, um, so today, Jeremy approached us, and this had been something he had kind of talked about last night, wanting to do, but he said, well, you know, I have a 4G service from my Sprint phone, and I'm getting 15, 20 megabits down on it. Can we use it to put all the public, self-public traffic out on? Yeah, we can. We don't really want to, but we can. That's a little bit of work, but oh, sure, we can do that. And so, I may let you talk about this. We um. On its surface, it's simple enough because, you know, you just add another interface and you route some of the traffic out onto that interface. You know, that's just a simple set up a new routing table and boom, everything's fine. The trouble is Jeremy said, oh, wait, no, we can't do that because Sprint looks at, uh, does some deep packet inspection and when they start seeing different user agents that are not possible on a mobile phone, they send resets. Basically, they terminate the connection. And so that's great. So okay, he said, can we tunnel that through, you know, something you know, OpenVPN, SSH tunnel, or whatnot? And so okay, we can do that. And that sounds a lot simpler than it is. And I'm going to let Rob go into some of that. <laughs> okay. Um, we set up a um, a VPN tunnel from Alan's laptop, which is stuck in the um, staff room. Alan's without it for the rest of the show. And um, from there, it goes to a, um, one of our remote sites, um, which is uh, in Indiana. Um, yeah. yeah, what's the name of that company? Uh, Om Omnicity, yeah. We have a, um, a VPS with them, and uh, they've been, 
we've been with them for quite some time. And we've got uh, everything going through one of our IP addresses there. Uh, we bound that IP address, which is, um, Alan's bringing up right now. No, oh, no, oh, okay, we're on the hotel. Okay. Anyway, it's um, uh, self.slackbuilds.org is the name of it. We can't be on the hotel now. I don't know how that worked. Because we got to there. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You're how can we do uh, oh, that's right. Little vendor land, not public. Okay, anymore. that's why we got that I, I address. Um, yeah, everything goes through this VPN. Well, we had trouble setting up the VPN, of course. We're trying to tunnel through a 4G cell phone, which is, um, it's not exactly tethered. I guess it's a wireless access point that your, uh, his laptop is connected to as a client. Well, uh, you, OpenVPN is best over UDP for numerous reasons. You don't want to run a TCP tunnel inside a TCP stream. You really only need one instance of the um, TCP um, error corrections. Yeah, error corrections and uh, error corrections and uh, God, I'll spit this out. Uh, guaranteed delivery. Right, packet sequencing. Uh, with UDP, you don't get any of that, which is exactly what you want for a VPN. It'll be reassembled on the other end as needed, and, and packets that are needed will be request, requested. Well, we found out that the cell provider does not allow any UDP out. We tried it on uh, various different ports, and we just weren't getting anywhere. We were seeing, actually, we were seeing the packets getting there, but it wasn't allowing them back in. So, um, they even hijacked 53 for DNS. Even, right, 53. We tried to uh, tunnel over the DNS port, which is often open, but they have that redirected to their own name server, so we weren't able to do that. We did get it working on uh, TCP. 443. Port 443, which is uh, your HTTPS port. Um, which is about the most common alternative for people like us who are forced to do the bad thing and tunnel over TCP. But it's working now. So right now, Sprint thinks Bank of America has moved to Omni City <laughs> because there's a crap load of 443 traffic passing over that network right now. <laughs> I mean, y you couldn't get it with two pickup trucks. It's but uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, let me collect my thoughts because, like we said, you know, we wanted to do the presentations and have the slides and config files and all that junk, but until about 30 minutes ago, they weren't even, you know, solid. So, uh, anyhow, once we got the uh, tunnel up, what we had to do was connect my laptop up to the server here and do a, uh, a source NAT, a, a masquerade, IP tables, you know, network address translation, so that the server could go out over that. And we had to do that over the TON0 interface, which is the, uh, the virtual interface that gets created for the uh, VPN. And then we had to figure out some way to route the public over that and the vendors and staff over the other so we don't completely saturate, you know, just the, uh, the 4G wireless. Because, uh, I mean, we only have limited bandwidth either way, you know. Uh, and uh, Robbie and Rob Alt, they come up with some, some nice custom route tables with, you know, additional route tables. And that was a little bit above my head, I won't lie to you. Uh, and if it's above, well, I'm short, so never mind. <laughs> Uh, but uh, once we got that took care of, you know, things started passing and then Squid just up and died on us for no particular reason. Uh, and we still haven't gotten that straightened out. So, you know, there's no web cache. You know, if you hit a, a web page, we wanted it to, you know, the first person to hit slash dot dot org 
cache it, and then we don't have to go out over the net. We can just source it here locally and then, you know, update every 15, 20 minutes, whatever. But uh, that's no good. So please try and be a little conservative with that 4G because it's actually Jeremy's phone, and I'm not entirely sure. Well, well screw him. Use it to your heart's desire. <laughs> Do you have a question in the back? I saw your hand up earlier. How many hours of sleep we've had in the past? <laughs> <laughs> Questions, how many hours of sleep we've had in the past few days? Uh, you know, I don't know. We had that first night, I meant to mention that, thank you. That first night, we all turned in about four uh, in the morning. And, of course, the conference started at nine Friday morning. So uh, you can do the math there. There were about three, maybe four at the most. Uh, last night, uh, for those of you that hung around the bar late, you noticed we didn't go in until around 2. Um, then the conference started again at 9, so. Well, you did have that. Okay. I didn't get here at 9 this morning. Uh, I think, yeah, it, you know, I don't know, probably averaging uh, five or six hours. We're, we're doing okay. Um, you know, we're, we're nerds. You know, we, don't, we don't need as much sleep as the normal population, right? I just want to add a caveat to that question. David snores. <laughs> Would you like to respond? No. <laughs> I'm not in the room with him, but Alan also snores. I am in the room with Rob, and Rob snores and growls and snorts and all sorts of other <laughs> stuff. <laughs> No lie, at the last self afterwards, you know, I stay in a motel when I work up in Atlanta because I don't live in Atlanta because I got sense. Uh, and I let, I let Rob out here and Robbie uh, stay with me one night so they wouldn't have to drive the whole way through. And uh, I think we turned in about midnight that night. One o'clock in the morning, this son bitch is snoring, wakes me up, and I can't go back to sleep. So I went to work that morning at 1.30. <laughs> and uh, still couldn't sleep because it was ringing in my ears. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's neither here nor there. We should probably get back on topic, shouldn't we? Yeah, do y'all want the topic or you want this stuff? So the question was, did y'all want the topic or do you want this stuff? Okay, I have one. This is funny. Keep going. I got a question here. Let's do a chair. Ooh, that's a good question. Do we have a phone number for Time Warner that we can? Uh, I do not have a phone number for Time Warner. Uh, He's been wanting to do that since yesterday. Davey, go ahead. What you got? Okay, so he wants us to tell you about the access points we like so much. We've actually got two different uh, ones. They're both uh, in Gadget. And I tell you what, that's such an easy question. My chauffeur just walked in the back there in that plaid shirt. I'm going to ask him to come up here and answer that question for me. Kevin, come on up, man. We got a lot of help on that from Kevin, and I'd like to thank him for all of that. <laughs> Those were ingenious APs, by the way, not in Gadget. Um, uh, but, you know, Ke Kevin was so kind to bring those to us, and they're wonderful. I'll let him tell you a little about those. All right, what's the question? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're ingenious. Um, I, I've got them deployed in a number of places. I've got one facility. They make indoor and outdoor grade access points. Um, um, I've got a couple of facilities, 80 acres plus, that I've, I've got covered with those things. Um, they allow you to do multiple SSIDs. You can do four SSIDs per, per access point, VLANs. Um, 
They can even set up as routers, client bridges. If you've got a, a WISP, you can actually set those up to, to uh, you know, pull that in. Uh, I don't know. What else? Um, they're typically less than 100 bucks a piece. Uh, 29, 29, yeah. Um, yeah, they're, uh, I've got a couple of facilities. I've got, um, links that are about three quarters of a mile. Um, I've got them on a couple of water tanks, actually, broadcasting, doing data backhaul for, um, it's, uh, for water meter systems. Work very well, very stable. Um, there's one report, um, the, I think it's their 2611 model. In Texas, they built two 300-foot towers, 20 miles apart, and with just the standard antenna, they got a link, and they're using that as a 20-mile link with those things. So I mean, they're they're pretty, pretty strong. So. 20 miles in Texas, that's line of sight, right? Line of sight, yeah, line of sight. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> The question was, what's the platform they run on? And it is something. <laughs> Bootloader's Red Boot. Okay, so it's a Debian base with some BusyBox junk, apparently. Uh, we can't confirm that 100%. Yeah, they won't, they won't give us that information. It's, it's we, should, we should call them and ask for the source code. Uh, and if they're in Taiwan, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, they'll communicate with us about as well as Time Warner did. <laughs> Let's thank Jim. To, I think maybe something else you were asking, maybe, is... Uh, there's only four for this this whole area we've got covered. There's only, where's the fifth? I didn't place a fifth. In the right. We placed three of those smoke detector looking ones and two of the ones with the antennas. Okay, I apologize. There are five. I only placed four. I wasn't aware of the fifth one. Um, but this this whole area that's covered, I mean, there's five APs, and with some better spacing, you could cover a lot more area. Um, but three of them are the standard what you would think of when you think of an AP, two antennas on there. Uh, two of them are the smoke detector styles, and like you, I'm, I'm kind of crazy about those. I, I have a feeling I'll be buying a couple of those real soon now. <laughs> Any other questions? I, in case it's not clear, we're kind of winging it at this point. At this, at this point? point. <laughs> <laughs> what are we using for DNS? Rob Alt, this one's yours. Okay. Actually, Alan is the one who set it up, but we've just got. He fixed uh, it. I well, I fixed it. Yeah, um, we've just got um, internal. We've got a self dot lan zone, which is all our forward names. We have um, a separate reverse zone for each uh, of the uh, what six subnets. We've only got Five. three subnets for, oh, three. for the uh, wireless. You set up six zones, though, didn't you? 32, 33, 34. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, this all could have been done in one zone, but Alan does the best he can. <laughs> you, sir, can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, it does work. And, and when, you, um, when your client requests a DHCP address, the DHCP server tells the name server, and uh, your name is registered in the uh, self.lan and your IP address will resolve to that name. Oh, I'm sorry. It's ISC, DHCPD, and bind, bind uh, name D. Any other, was that what you were asking? Okay. All right, any other question? Um, I want to thank Jeremy for nothing. <laughs> And uh, the self staff have been really helpful. All of them have been really good to us. The hotel has done a good job. I wish they had some better infrastructure, but you can't really blame the current employees for that. Um, and again, thanks to Kevin. Um, and thank you all. Brian. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, to to kind of clarify us on that, let, let's let's just be honest. We had no friggin' idea what we were getting into uh, the, last year. Yeah, yeah, and 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 really, I've heard Jeremy describe 2009 the same way. That you know, 2009 Southeast Linux Fest. He had no idea. None of us really had any idea what we were getting into that year, and it's hey, it worked out. And that's kind of where we were yesterday. You know. The, we had a lot of ideas in our head of how we were going to do this, but quite frankly, our only experience with this conference was as attendees and speakers. And so, you know, last year I was kind of half joking when I told Jeremy, hey, next year we'll take care of the network stuff. And then the next thing I knew, this year was rolling around, and he says, oh, by the way, I got y'all down to cover network stuff. I'm like, oh, damn. And <laughs> so. Yes, yes, and and so here we are. So we, we really didn't know what we were getting into, or, or what we were going to have to work with. And you know, I told you the Time Warner story already, so you know, a bit of a fiasco there. But this this was a big learning experience for us. And the biggest problem was we had all talked. Uh, in case it's not clear, we we all are friends, real life and online. And so you know, we, we all had have an IRC server on our one of our co-load servers, and so we talked there and kind of had a game plan for what we wanted to do, without specifics, of course, but we knew what we wanted to do. And then we get here, and all that's gone, gone to hell in a handbasket. Uh, so all, pretty much all of this was improvised. It was okay, so we can't do that, so now what? Um, and, and so I guess where I'm going with all this, I said a lot of words to say this. I apologize for this not being exactly what we hoped it would be. Um, Although I hope you can at least agree that we made the best of what we had. And so, you know, if not, then, you know, file complaints with Jeremy and he can find somebody else to do the network next year. <laughs> <laughs> he might have to anyway. It's <laughs> uh, a valid point. So any other questions, comments, random thoughts? He might want to anyway. No, yeah, well, there's that. Yes, sir. Oh, definitely. The question was, did we have fun? And the answer is, uh, certainly, we we're having fun still. Did you have fun? All right. So if you guys are enjoying it, that's what really matters. Uh, any others? No? Okay, well, that's great. We're going to go find a beer store and buy some more for this evening. Thank you. How do you turn this off? Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, 
so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, 
We've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digim, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Astros cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Astros convoy communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.